All right. Well, I think we shall get started then. Um, so thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk about visualizing survival data, uh, which is something I love to do. I, uh, so uh, just before we get started, um, repeat a couple things I may have said earlier and you may have missed. Uh, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Um, we will definitely have time at the end um, and perhaps we can um, answer them uh, while we're uh, chatting live as well. Uh, I made a small little website using Quarto for this webinar, um, and we can drop that in the chat, that URL, and it has links to the slides. And after the YouTube video has been posted, I'll add that here too. It'll be kind of like your one-stop shop for uh, all of the slides and the recordings from today's webinar. <clears throat> so of course over here is the, on the left is the, the package websites link and then the slides link. So I think we can get started. So like I said, we're going to be visualizing survival data today, and we're going to be using the GG Surfit package. So, uh, <clears throat> and I think it's a really fantastic package for many reasons, which we will get into. Um, all of this material is licensed under the Creative Commons uh, Universal License. So check that out if you haven't seen that before. And I am Daniel Soberg here with you, and I'm delighted to be here. So uh, just quickly about me, um, I am a data scientist at Genentech. It's a member uh, subsidiary of Roche, a very large pharmaceutical company. And I've been working there for about six months now. Uh, previous to working at Genentech, uh, I was at the Prostate Cancer Clinical Trials Consortium and um, a biostatistician at Memorial Sloan Kettering. That's where I spent most of my time, 13 years. And at Sloan Kettering, I wrote lots and lots and lots of papers. And so of course at a cancer center, we're always talking about time uh, to event analyses or survival analyses. So, uh, so I think I've published maybe 250, 300 papers and, uh, and many, many, many of those papers uh, use the methods that we're going to talk about today. And uh, unfortunately I didn't write the package until much later in my tenure there could have been really helpful for doing a lot of those analyses. Uh, uh, I really enjoy writing our packages. I, I've written a, a number of them. Uh, and uh, well, I think that's good. So what, what we're going to cover today. So we're going to do a very, very brief outline uh, or uh, review of what survival analysis is or what survival data is. We're going to talk about Kaplan-Meier estimators, competing risks estimating, and then do some advanced topics in the GG Surfit uh, package. So to begin, this is the briefest overview of survival analysis methods. So here are a couple uh, uh, papers that have tutorials on survival analysis. I think they're really great because the entry point of the, these are at a tutorial level. So it's much easier to digest some of these. Uh, and I recommend to check them out if you want more information. So to begin, I'm going to just read a quote from this paper that I thought was sum summarizes what survival data is quite well. Survival times are data that measure follow-up time from a defined starting point to the occurrence of a given event. For example, the time from the beginning to the end of a remission period, or the time from the diagnosis of a disease, a diagnosis of a disease to death. Uh, standard statistical techniques cannot usually be applied because the data are often censored. This is most, one of the most important parts. Survival analysis has censored data. Survival time is described as censored when there is follow-up time, but that yet the event that you're watching for has not yet occurred. So survival analysis or survival data appear in a many, many fields, and um, they go by different names. So there's survival analysis, which is how we call them in, in medicine typically reliability analysis, duration analysis, event history analysis, and time to event analysis. So a couple common examples of survival data that you may have encountered in your work are time from, for example, surgery to death, time from the start of a treatment to progression of disease, time from HIV infection to development of AIDS, and the list goes on. Um, <clears throat> so the key here is the data that we're gonna be talking about today, we have some kind of starting point and then we're going to follow participants or patients up until some endpoint of interest, um, whether that be recurrence of disease or death or you know, some of these other examples. So here is a small little graph that's illustrating what time to event or survival data may look like when you have full follow-up on every single patient. So these, this is a representation of five patients um, who were all underwent some treatment and we're following them from that treatment 
until they pass away. Um, and those little skulls are, are when they actually pass away. So in this example, we are observing 100% of the follow-up time. So if I wanted to summarize something like time from their treatment to their death, because I have full follow-up on every single patient here, I can get the mean time to death. I can get the median time to death. I can do all of the standard things. That all works when you have full follow-up. But what happens when I have the more common uh, uh, data where we have follow-up on some patients for a year, for a month, for 10 years, but at the end of that follow-up period, they may still be alive. Um, and we don't know into the future, of course, when that patient will, will pass away. We can use that observed amount of follow-up time to still estimate what we're looking for typically, like the time to death, for example. Um, so in this figure, again, the solid lines are the observed times, but those dashed lines are unobserved. So we actually can never know when someone will actually die. Um, and that's why we have to use these survival methods. So in this case, we need to use survival analyses. The whole field of survival analyses was invented to handle situations like this. So your standard methods like calculating means, medians, percentiles for time to death or time to recurrence. In survival analysis, the most common method is going to be called the Kaplan-Meier estimator. So that's kind of our one-to-one -one, uh, link here. When you might have previously done a t-test to look at the difference in the time to death between two treatment groups, for example, you may do a t-test or a rank sum test, a Will Cox rank sum test. In survival analysis, you're going to do a log rank test. And where previously you may have done something like a logistic regression or a linear regression, in survival analysis, you're going to do a Cox proportional hazards regression. Uh, you know, for each one of these cases, there are various methods uh, to do these. Uh, like, so Kappa, Meyer, and Log, Rank, and Cox, those are just the three most common examples. Um, but there are, of course, many, many, many more. So I guess let's just start. This is probably you're familiar with this already. This is a Kaplan. This is an illustration of a Kaplan Meyer estimator. This, in this case, this is we are modeling recurrence-free survival, so time from some kind of surgery uh, to recurrence, and we are looking uh, at two groups: people who had a limited time since surgery, uh, and then people who had an extended time since surgery, and. GG Surfit, the package really exists just because we, I just really felt that we needed a very, very simple way to make this super common figure uh, that really just wasn't, I didn't feel like the existing tools were really doing it justice. And, I, and so, I, so we started making this package. So things I love about this package. So GG Surfit was written with proper ggplot2 geomes. So what does that mean? It means that you can use the ggsurfit geomes and you can also just weave them seamlessly with any ggplot function. You don't need to learn extra ggsurfit syntax if you want to change the title, if you want to change the padding on your um, ggplot, on your figure. You don't need to, if you want to add additional breaks, points, or change the theme of the figure. Again, you don't need to learn any ggsurfit uh, syntax for that. That all can be just handled directly with ggplot. You can modify the x-axis in any way you want. So in some of the previous tools that existed, um, if you modified the uh, padding on each side of the figure, the risk table below would not line up, for example. Uh, another easy thing we can do with ggsurfit that wasn't previously possible was there was just very, very simple saving. Just take your figure, pass it to ggsave, the ggplot function, and you can save your image in many, many formats. And these figures really just kind of come out and they are just ready to publish. So these are the things that really made me want to write ggsurfit and I think the things that make it great. So we're going to be today um, using throughout <clears throat> the examples uh, a slight modification on the survival packages colon data set. Um, the, the difference here is that this is called DF colon. 
it is exported from ggsurfit and it is a tibble and it has labels assigned to the columns and some of the numeric values have been made into factors with uh, with uh, factor levels defined as characters. So it's just a little bit more informative uh, to look at when we are uh, viewing our results. So we're going to be primarily concerned with these three columns in the df colon uh, data frame. It's going to be time. That is our time to disease recurrence. The status. Did you? Did we observe you recurring? That's a one. Um, uh, yes or no. So in the zero would mean you are censored. So we didn't we did not observe your recurrence. And then surge is going to be that surgical timing, and that is going to be our stratifying variable here. So just to give you a quick quick overview of this data frame, this is not how I would recommend summarizing this, like in a publication, for example, in a journal, but it it gives us analysts a uh, quick overview of this. So when we're looking at the follow-up time, that time column, uh, the median is 4.24, so about four years, right? And we have the ranges from one to six years. Uh, 468 of the 929 uh, participants in this data set did observe a recurrence. And <clears throat> about 73 had a limited time since surgery and about 27% had a extended time since surgery. So one group is larger than the other. So classically, if you needed to get a Kaplan-Meier estimator, you would use the survival package. It's really great, I love it, I use it all the time. And there's a function in the survival package called surfit. And this syntax shows you how you would get the Kaplan-Meier estimators. Um, and I'm showing you two very, very similar versions here. One from the survival package using the surfit and one from ggsurfit and a function called surfit2. The API, uh, what you're putting into that function, function is exactly the same between these two functions. And you can see that the results are exactly the same. So there must be some difference here, right? Uh, it's very, very small. It's very slight difference. Um, the ggsurfit2 function, it tracks the environment from which the call was made. And that allows us to accurately reconstruct or parse the call, the original call, at any point post-estimation. And because we know the environment from which it was called, we can go into, for example, the data frame that uh, the call was made from. And we can go looking for labels in there and we can go back and use that data to calculate p-values from the log rank test, for example. Um, nearly every function in the GDC for surfit package will work perfectly well with both surfit2 and surfit from the survival package. Um, however, when you use surfit, there's going to be enhanced enhancements to what the defaults are, including those labels from the columns, for example, um, and there's a few other things. So uh, I think that's, uh, again, just, it may look a little bit different because you're calling surfit2 when you may be used to be calling surfit, but really you can see here this Waldo comparison um, of surfit object one and surfit object two. You can see that they're exactly the same except for on that bit where it says names new, you can see there's an environment in that list. And that is that calling environment that I was referring to. So that, that point is a bit technical. So if it doesn't make sense, don't worry. You don't need to know about it. That was really just for, for me so I could do more for you as a default. So let's just get started. This is your very basic Kaplan-Meier plot, your, your estimator. So you see the first line, we're calling surfit2. And um, we are getting our Kaplan-Meier estimates. That is just an object with all of these uh, estimation inside of it. Um, and we are passing that object directly to ggsurfit. So that's our first ggsurfit function, right? And uh, I'm also adding a risk table. So very, three very, very simple common lines. And you've, you've really done a lot of work here already. You're, you're figure is really coming along. I think that's pretty great. So that's like the most basic example. But of course, there's a lot of good here. It's like really simple code. The risk table, you got the risk table very easily. Um, you can actually see even the x-axis label um, 
that was taken from the time variable in the data set that is that that column's label so i recommend using labeled columns everywhere i really love them um, you're, you, you can see that we're using our typical ggplot plus notation to add more things to that figure that's going to come in handy much later a, a bit later um, but certainly there is there are a few things lacking here right the y-axis label it says survival probability because you know like what yeah, what else is it going to say that's actually not accurate in this case we're talking about recurrences so that's not even accurate um, and you can see here that we're showing the view of the amount of area in the figure is where the data exists. So that goes from about 40% survival to 100% survival. But typically in a survival curve, you're going to see 0 to 100. Uh, the access padding here, you can see on, on the x-axis, for example, it's more extreme. There is quite a bit of space on the left and right-hand sides of that data. Uh, in the survival curve, I just don't like that much padding. And uh, the x-axis typically has more tick marks uh, than just these four shown. So I think this is a lovely generic ggplot default. But if I'm doing Kaplan Meier figures, I would probably want to do a little bit more. So let's, how can we change these few things? Let's just add two more lines. The first one is a ggsurfit command called scale ggsurfit. And what this is, it's just a simple wrapper for scale x continuous, a ggplot function, and scale y continuous to just make it a little bit more kaplan meyer esque And then we're at, and the second function we're adding here is lab. That's a ggplot function. And I'm changing the y lab label, the, uh, the y axis label. So in this case, that scale gd surfer has reduced the padding to something that looks a little bit nicer for survival curves. Uh, and the x axis is reporting additional tick marks. So you can see it went from four tick marks all the way up to, uh, you can't see very well, 10 tick marks. And at the same time, that risk table was updated to put uh, numbers at each one of those tick marks. And we've also updated that y-axis. Uh, one thing I love about the package is not only can you seamlessly use ggplot function like labs, you can use any one of the you know, hundreds of extension packages. So this is ggeasy, uh, uh, a package that really kind of helps you remember the code a little bit better for uh, modifying the themes, which can be a little bit complex in ggplot. So this ggeasy function, easy move legend top, moves our legend from the top. So previously here, it was below the figure, above the risk table, you call that, and now the legend's on the top. So I'm just really illustrating here that it just works seamlessly with ggplot, but also any ggplot extension. I think that's super fantastic. I also wanted to illustrate that we do basic transformations here as well. So in the ggsurfit, I've added the argument type equals risk. And so instead of starting at 100% and showing down what my recurrence free probability is, I am now looking at the risk of recurrence. So starting at zero and climbing up as time goes on. <clears throat> so I touched on this just a moment ago, but I just want to make it very, very explicit here. So what is scale GG surfit? It is a simple wrapper for scale Y continuous, scale X continuous. These are the actual values. It changes the padding. That's the expand argument. It changes the limits to zero to one uh, for the Y axis. And for the Y axis, you have actually a percent scale now on the Y axis for the labels. And for the X, it, we're asking for, uh, again, reduced padding. And then the number of breaks has been requested to be eight. Uh, now, you, this is actually what happens for survival figures. But in the last example, we asked for risk. So in that case, it didn't set the limits to zero to one because you don't need to go all the way up to 100% in a risk curve. So what scale GD surfit is going to do is going to look at the context of what you've requested in your survival curve. And it's just going to give you a good default. One very important thing about using this function, I use this function every time I make the, the package uh, and make a, a figure uh, of survival. But scales in ggplot uh, really can't just be mixed and matched like they can uh, a lot of the other functions in ggplot. So if you're using scale gg surfit, you cannot subsequently call scale x continuous or scale y continuous. The reason is that scales are not additive, rather they replace. So when I call scale gg surfit, I'm changing, for example, the limits to be from zero to one. If I were to then subsequently call 
scale y continuous to do some other kind of modification, it's going to delete all of those other scales that I have specified and only do the ones that I've specified in scale y continuous in that second call. So what you would need to do in that sense is pass those additional arguments that you would typically call use to a separate call to scale x or scale y continuous and put them in the scale gg surfit. So on that last line, you can see here that I'm calling scale gg surfit and I'm saying x scales, I'm putting it in the list. I want my breaks to be from zero to nine and I'm explicitly saying that and that will add that argument to the scale x continuous argument rather than replacing all of the lovely defaults that we've sent with padding, number of breaks, all those other such things. So what essentially we're going to go through now is I think you've seen an example where you had a very simple survival analysis. You made a Kaplan-Meier estimator and you added a risk table and it looked good. And honestly, that's like 95% of what you need to do. So that's what really, if you have a takeaway, we've already covered it. Uh, we're going to spend the next, uh, you know, the, whatever time we have here to go through this, going through some more advanced examples on how to do some more advanced customizations, which is, again, one of the best parts is that you can do these advanced customizations. So I'm just going to define a very basic default GG surfit Kaplan Meyer curve here. Uh, you can see I'm starting with a surfit to call. That's our Kaplan Meyer estimator, going to do all the calculations for us. I'm then passing that to GG surfit, and I'm doing a function called add confidence intervals. So that's a GG surfit function. And what it's going to do is it's going to add a ribbon here around each of the groups with our confidence interval. And of course, I'm adding a title here with the labs. Again, that's a GG plot function. And I'm saying this is kind of our default. This is this is our base. And I'm going to show you how we can modify it. So this looks like a lot of code because it is. ggplot code can get a little bit long if you're going to get really particular about exactly what you want uh, your graph to look like. But again, what you're doing here is you're using the ggplot skills you already have. You're not learning new gg surface skills. You're just using your ggplot skills if you've got them. I look them up all the time. <laughs> They're not really inherent to me all, in every graph that I'm making. So here, again, we're just starting with that GG default that we just made and we are calling cohort Cartesian. So what that's gonna do is going to zoom in. So previously we were looking at time up to nine plus years, I think a little bit past nine, but this is saying, I wanna zoom in to eight years only. So that's how you would do that in GG, any ggplot function. And that's how you do that here with ggsurfit as well. Um, rather than using uh, scales, uh, ggsurfit scales, I'm calling scale y continuous by myself. And I'm essentially doing the same thing, but I just changed the padding a little bit. And I'm doing something similar for x scale x continuous. I don't want the default colors. So here I am changing the colors for my color and my fill uh, aesthetics. I'm adding the minimal theme from ggplot and I am moving the legend to the bottom. For my guide, previously we had the two groups side by side. Here I'm saying I want those groups stacked into one column. And then lastly, I am adding a title. I'm changing the title from default to styled, and I'm changing the y-axis title to percent survival. And there it all is. And here's our figure now. So you can see like that minimal theme, our, our legend is now in one column. Uh, our, our title's been updated, the colors have been updated, the label on the Y axis is now on the percent scale, the Y label uh, is also updated, the Y title, the Y axis title, I should say. So again, this is really just illustrating, you can just use everything you already know about ggplot to make this figure do anything you want. Now, this is actually not that hard to do without ggsurfit, but where things get complicated very, very quickly is when you want a risk table. So let's talk about risk tables. So here is our, again, our basic plot, but this time we have a risk table. Um, <clears throat> and let's, let's, let's change it up a little bit. So uh, here I'm, I'm applying this scale GG surfit and I'm adding that risk table. And so previously you saw that the risk table, or I should, let me tell you about the risk table, what we're looking at here. 
we have our two stratification groups, limited times in surgery and extended. So the, <clears throat> excuse me, the risk table is grouped by those stratum by default. So, and it's showing you two rows. So you actually might commonly only see the number at risk, but in by default in GG Surfit, what we do is we give you the number at risk and the cumulative number of events that have been observed, which I think is a, a fantastic thing to be reporting along with your figures, because uh, it can be quite informative. I've seen a lot of kaplan meyer figures that like quickly drop off to zero and you're like, wow, look at the event rates in that group that that those people have really bad recurrence rates um and who are getting that treatment and if you look at the number of events you're like oh well in that group you only had five people and four of them had the event really quickly okay while that could mean that there's really bad recurrence rates in that that group you really only have four or five people so that's not a lot of data and that can be kind of obfuscated sometimes uh, without reporting the number of events so i highly recommend that you put the number of events in there by default. Um, for a couple of years, I was a statistical editor at European Urology, and uh, we did lots and lots of oncology there. And we started adding these uh, cumulative number of events counts to our kaplan meier figures uh, when the authors were able to do that for us. And I think it just really increases the quality of the publication. But anyway, for the takeaway from this graph is that it's the risk table is grouped by those stratifications. But if you prefer not to have a group by stratification, uh, you can group by risk table, okay? Uh, the risk table stats. So you, now you can see that the first section is the number at risk and the second section is the number of events. And then on the left uh, axis there, uh, you have the stratification variables. So I think that that kind of functionality is really nice uh, and super helpful. But when I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh, well, those the names of those groups are actually really long and they're actually not that nice to look at. Um, so there is a function that you can uh, add on top of that called add risk table symbol, strata symbol. So it will replace those long names with a symbol. And here I'm putting in a UTF-8 character for a circle and the color is going to match your legend. Uh, I see there's a question, uh, what's so, let me see if I can answer that quickly. Does the GG Surfer package work with survey Cox pH or survey weighted survival models? Um, that's a great question, and I'm not entirely sure. So, this package is all about univariate analyses and not like Cox regression. So, the answer about survey Cox models, I'm going to just say no. Um, and I, I don't know if I've ever had to create a weighted. Kaplan Meyer in R. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but that's a good question. Uh, if you would, if you'd like to know the answer for sure, what you can do is uh, go onto the GitHub page and post a code example of how you would just do it outside of ggsurfit. And I can then look to see if that would be compatible with ggsurfit. And if it's not, we can put it in a future request and maybe something we can support in the future. So here <clears throat> we are seeing that um, we're using GG, uh, the add risk table strata symbol to change that long text label to just be a simple circle that match with a color that matches the legend. How about Cox ME? I am not sure. So again, that's a Cox model. And that is not what GG Surfit is all about. GG Surfit is about our, our univariate analyses. So I'm going to assume no, because even a regular Cox model, I'm not sure what illustration we're looking for in that situation. <clears throat> all right. Customizing our risk table stats. So in addition to being able to group it differently or however you like or replace text long text labels with colors and symbols, you can also take that kind of like long table um, that had one section for at risk and one section for events and you can just kind of like group it onto one line. So uh, you can see here on line three of the code that I'm saying risk table stats equals and then I'm using some glue syntax, some glue like syntax here. So I'm putting n dot risk up front, right? And then in parentheses, I'm putting hume.event. 
And you can check out the documentation for add risk table. There's a couple of other um, statistics that you can put into the risk table. And, and in this case, you can see the risk table has been updated to have the number at risk, and then in parentheses right next to it, the cumulative number of events. Let's talk quantiles. So this is a very common thing that uh, we show on our Kaffenmeyer figures, right? So by default, we're going to often want to report like the median survival or the median time to recurrence or death, for example. So you'll see a lot of these lines that have been drawn onto our Kaffenmeyer estimated figures. And I just want to show you that it's very easy to add that line here too. So with a quick call to um, add quantile, you're going to, I've written it explicitly here that I'm putting it at the Y value of 0 0.5, but that is the default as well. Um, and you can see here that it's been added. You might be looking at this figure like, wait, there are two groups here, but there's only one line. Um, if you zoom in on the red line right up there at nine years, you can see that it actually doesn't quite ever meet 50% survival there, and therefore there was no place to put the figure. So that group doesn't actually reach its median survival. You can also see here, we're illustrating that there's another function in ggsurfit called add sensor mark. Um, I think for some smaller studies, add, adding these censoring indications is, is useful. Um, in my work, I, you know, I typically work with uh, data sets that are a bit larger, including like in this one, I would say. And uh, I don't really like seeing the censoring marks, but it is something that is commonly seen in the literature. So we wanted to make sure that was possible as well. So quick call to add sensor mark adds our sensor markings. In addition to adding quantiles, um, you can also add, for example, uh, lines at five-year survival. So I wanna know what five-year survival recurrence rates are in each of those groups. So here I'm showing a line up from five years and then goes off to the left to show that kind of that difference in survival between the two groups. And you can see here, we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, coming up, but you can see in the add quantile call, I'm adding line type equals solid, line width equals one, alpha equals 0.3. You'll see that those are just like actually very, very common arguments that are passed to, GG, to ggplot geomes. And those all work seamlessly with ggsurfit. So let's talk a little bit about that. So each one of these GG surfit functions that we're going to primarily be talking about is being powered by an underlying ggplot function. So GG surfit is being powered by geome step. The add confidence intervals is being powered by geome ribbon. And add sensor mark is geome points. So those are just points on a line, right? And add quantile, or we're adding segments to our to our figure. Anything that geome step, geome ribbon, geome point, and geome uh, uh, segment accept in those dot, dot, dot arguments can be passed to the ggsurfit function, and we will just pass it directly to that ggplot function. So again, making it very, very simple to style your figure in pretty much limitless ways. So in this quick example at the bottom, I wanted to change the color, so I passed color to ggsurfit. Uh, of course, I want the uh, the confidence interval to match that. So I, I'm, I'm going to pass that fill um, uh, argument to make the same color. And I want my censoring marks uh, to match the color. So I want to pass the color there as well. And I'm changing the default alpha, which I think is like around 50 or 80 or something. I'm making it entirely opaque here. So again, there are some defaults here, but you can override them very easily. And even when there are no defaults, you can add uh, anything accepted by those underlying functions you're also welcome to modify. Oh, looks like I did some cute highlighting, but I forgot to increment through. Um, some further risk table customization. So like, this is stuff I've actually never done myself, but I just wanted to show that just like you can style the primary ggplot, you can style the risk tables as well. So the risk tables are actually just simple calls to geom text where the numbers we're putting onto the plot area um, are just like the number at risk, the number of events, that kind of thing. So those are just separate ggplots entirely. So this theme argument is where you can just give uh, pass a list of any number of ggplot calls, right? And so you don't like the font size, change the font size. You want something bolded, pass that here, we'll bold it. 
Um, so that's just a ggplot. It accepts any ggplot customization there as well. There's an argument for risk table height. That's the first one listed here. Um, 0 0.33 means that, oh, for this figure, I want a third of the plot area to be covered by my risk table and the remaining to be the primary plot. And here I'm increasing the font size of the statistics in the risk table. So just like the primary plot is super customizable, the risk table is also customizable. I like the defaults. I think they work well, like nearly every single time. So I don't, I don't fuss with this, but you may need to. So here's what you're looking at. You can see that there's a bit more padding here in the risk table board bit. You can also see that the labels have been uh, bolded as we requested in the previous line as well. All right, so here's another long example. So let's go through it step by step. We're going to do type equals risk. Again, that's a transformation of our Kaplan-Meier from starting at 100 and going down to zero to starting at zero and going up to 100. We're changing our line width. We're adding a confidence interval. We're adding a risk table. But instead of using the default of only putting uh, of, of putting the events and the number at risk, we just want the number at risk. I'm adding a strata symbol and I am giving it a, a specified size. I'm adding quantiles for five-year recurrence rates. I want those lines, those line segments to be dotted and I want the line width to be 0 0.8. I'm adding sensory marks. I want them to be very, very light. I'm giving them an alpha of 0.2, but I want them a little bit larger than the default. Um, there's another function we haven't spoken about yet called add p-value. You can see that this um, argument caption equals log rank and then that glue syntax again in the curly brackets, p dot value, that is going to put the formatted p value from the log rank test in the figure's caption. Okay. You can also, there are also options in the add p value function to put it in the body of the primary image if that's what you like to do. Uh, and then lastly, I'm changing some of the colors and adding a uh, new title to my y axis label. And here's the plot. I think it looks really great. So again, we're doing risk instead of survival. We have our dotted lines for five-year survival uh, recurrence rates. We have our log rank p-value in the corner and the caption here of p equals 0 0.011. Um, and our, um, our groups have been labeled on the risk table uh, with that, those cute little uh, colorful circles instead of the default long labels. I love it. It's easy. It's cute. So I want to talk a bit about themes. So um, <clears throat> there is something called communicate. It, it was a published, I think, five years ago. Oh, 2008, it says right here on the slide. Um, and this is by Morris, Tim Morris, Tom Morris, Tim Morris, I believe. And what they did is they went and surveyed a bunch of statisticians and analysts who do survival analysis regularly and said, here are a bunch of survival figures. Which one do you like? Which one would you like to see? And so they did this survey and they kind of said, okay, well, we, we surveyed a bunch of statisticians and analysts, and these are the figures that we kind of all agree are the like best. Now, um, and we wanted to make that very easy to do if you are a communicate uh, convert. Um, I'm not a full communicate convert. I like certain elements of it. Some elements I'm like, I don't, I don't feel strongly about. Um, and I'll just stick with like a ggplot default, for example. Um, so not one size fits all for every, you know, communicate theme, but, but we did add this theme called theme gg surfit communicate. And it does make it very easy to make these um, graphs that look exactly like the recommendations from the, that, that survey of many statisticians. So um, to get that exact table, what they want is not just the number of risk and the number of events, but they also want the number of cumulatively censored patients. So now you're gonna have a bit of a larger risk table. You throw in that theme communicate function we just looked at, and you're going to use a ggplot theme to move the legend into the body of the graph. So that's the part actually I really don't like. Everything else I'm totally fine with. I don't know if the censoring gives a lot more information on top of the number of events. So I don't really feel strongly about that either, but more information never killed anyone. So here we are uh, with those three changes to our figure. Um, we have a wonderfully communicate compliant uh, survival analysis figure. So you can see here that um, 
there are no more grid lines going up and down guiding you. They're just all horizontal. I think that's perfectly fine. Um, and a little bit of the plot area has been modified with that theme communicate. And again, the legends in the plot area and our risk table has three rows. Risk table, uh, the number at risk, the number of cumulatively censored patients, and the number of cumulative events observed. So if you love that, there are other themes in the package as well. Um, but I think this is probably the most commonly uh, used one. All right, so for our friends who are in the pharmaceutical industry, who are using the CDISC Atom data model, or specifically the ADTTE data frames, um, this is a quick example of what they look like. Um, there's this param column that's kind of that tells you what the outcome is. So in this case, I'm using this ADTT data set, and it says that this is a progression-free survival endpoint. Of, it has a, a column called eval, or, and that is our analysis value. So that's the time value. And we have a sensor column, CNSR. That is, are you censored, yes or no? So a one means you're censored, a zero means you're not censored, or you have the event of interest. And then in this case, TRT01P is our um, stratifying treatment variable. So these are all highly, highly specified column names in the Atom uh, model. And so you, you can kind of count on these being your uh, column names. So the most jarring thing here that I find is that the outcome is called sensor and it's programmed in the exact opposite way that you would expect to do a survival analysis where typically you would say, I'm interested in this event. Yes, did you have a recurrence? One, you didn't have a recurrence, zero. They've gone and done the opposite. Uh, so it's a, it's like a very ripe space to make mistakes. Uh, and so to alleviate that concern, uh, we wrote a function called serve sensor. So it's just like the serve function from the survival package, but it just does a quick transformation for you internally. And you can look at that second bullet point there, survive um, where time equals a vol, an event is one minus sensor. We're doing right censoring and we're doing an origin at zero. So we can make all those assumptions because that's what the atom data model kind of imposes on us. All right. And also um, GG Surfit can look for uh, this kind of structured data set and say like, oh, you have a param column along with a vol and sensor. Oh, you must be using the CDISC atom model. I'm going to use that param column to give you some better um, uh, labeling in your default labeling in your figure. Of course, you can change it. So <clears throat> by just using this uh, Atom data set, ADTTE, and the serve sensor, we can very, very easily, uh, without having to transform the data ourselves, make a risk of figure, excuse me. And, um, and you can see here that everything just works out. It's all cute, it works out. And oh yes, and then that you can see the time, the X axis, it does have a nicer label here from the param column of that data set. So progression of free survival years rather than the default just would have been like time or something. Uh, okay, so competing risk data. We're, we're coming into the, the home stretch here. So I know this is a lot of information. Competing risk data is another flavor of survival data. Um, so the most common type of competing risk you're going to encounter while you're doing work um, is that you, uh, so a competing event is something that modifies the risk of the event of interest that you're actually modeling. And what that commonly means is something's happened so that the chance of your event of interest occurring is now zero. And that is commonly going to be death from another cause unrelated. So uh that's that's what you're going to work on oh we have a quick question over here uh from lang is there option for ci or confidence bands um uh i'm not quite sure um anything that so we're taking the calculations directly from the surfit uh object from the survival package so if you can whatever transformation or whatever um you know, confidence interval calculation that you want. If it's possible in Surfit, it's possible in GG Surfit. I hope that helps. Um, <clears throat> okay, back to competing risks real quick. We, um, 
so in this, so the competing risk we're going to illustrate here is um, death from another cause. So we're looking at, you know, recurrence of disease. And if I'm following up someone for a recurrence of their cancer and they end up dying of something totally unrelated to their treatments or their cancer, which happens unfortunately sometimes, the chance that we observe them recurring is now zero. And that's called a competing event. And you can go look this up. There are lots of papers showing that if you don't account for those kinds of changes in the data, that you are biasing your results somewhat. And ggsurfit package plays nicely with the tidy comp risk package for doing competing risks analysis. So in tidy comp risk, you use the QM inc function to get the cumulative incidence estimates. So that very first line is just a vanilla call from uh, the tidy comp risk package. And you pipe that, instead of piping it into ggsurfit, you pipe it into ggqmink and you tell it which of the outcomes you're interested in. Because we're looking at death from cancer here when the competing event here is also death from other causes. So we're primarily interested in death from cancer. And then after that, everything else is exactly the same. It's all the same. So essentially swap out your ggsurfit call with a ggqmink call and you are good to go. So easy peasy, I think. Uh, a couple of other more advanced customizations that you may need are some figures that are side by side. Um, my favorite package to kind of cobble together uh, ggplots is called Patchwork. It's really nice, super easy to use. Um, but before you can use Patchwork with ggsurfit, you need to understand a little bit about how the figures are constructed in the background. Now, remember I said that you can do anything you can modify your primary plot in ggsurfit in any way, and the risk table will still align. Um, and that is because we delay the construction of the risk table until you've made all of your adjustments to that primary plot. So if you're adding the padding and it's huge, if you're squishing this part of expanding that part, which is all possible in uh, ggplot, um, we are going to delay the construction of our risk table to match that, right? So that's how we get it to line up, no matter what you've done. And that is done in the print method via a function called ggsurfit build. So when you build your ggsurfit, I'm taking that primary plot, I'm looking at exactly all the modifications you've made, and I am constructing the risk tables in the exact same way to make sure that they perfectly align with one another. So <clears throat> you just have to account for that, that building um, part. Uh, before you can use patchwork, because otherwise that building will never occur and it, you won't have what you're looking for. Uh, I do have an open issue in patchwork right now to kind of uh, expose one of the uh, intricacies of the package uh, to the users so that we can write methods for it, in like S3 methods, for example, uh, for my class of ggsurfit. So I can do a slight building before we cobble them together with um, patchwork. Uh, the issue has been marked as a feature request and hasn't been closed immediately. It's been open for, I think, over just over a year now. So uh, hopefully uh, it's a very, very small change, but hopefully we can, that will be in some future release of Patchwork and we can simplify this process because I'm going to show you the code now. It's not the easiest. So the first set of codes here, uh, we're making our GG plot, our GG surfit plot, um, and saving it to the object P. And then around line eight, we are building that GG surfit and we're saving it as a new object built P. And once you have built P, then you can use those patchwork operators. Here we're using the horizontal bar because I want to put two plots right next to each other. You can use a slash to stack them. There's a lot of ways you can, you can do this. Um, and, and these are really great. So if this feature does get implemented in the future, um, then you can see on line 10, you would be able to call just like P, vertical bar P. Uh, okay, we have a question from Suman. Did you already indicate that this package is not useful to fit a Cox model? If not, then can a Cox model with splines of a continuous variable with interactions of a, another variable can be used? Thanks. So um, Cox models are a bit out of scope because a univariate uh, representation of the Kaplan Meyer estimator is actually quite different from the Cox. Uh, if you do go to the package website and there is a vignette called gallery on the website, if you scroll to the very, very bottom, there is one case where you actually can 
use GG Surfit with a Cox model. And that's because Survival Surfit was um, also written to be able to handle this kind of thing. And it's that's it's a special type of Cox model called a stratified Cox model. So if you're doing a stratified Cox model, you can visualize those stratum with GG Surfit. Um, but as far as working with splines and you know all these other things, you really need to look into the details of how Surfit is handling that. Um, splines, when you're kind of doing adjusted figures, they really need you to be very, very careful because you can't just take the average um, like you typically would with a covariate because if I've done splines for age, for example, that means I might have like two, three or four or five or more uh, uh, variables in my Cox model representing that curvy age relationship. And what I would need to do there to do an adjusted model would be get the average age or the mean age and then calculate what each spline value would be at that average age rather than just taking the average of those new spline columns. So just be very, very careful whenever you're working with anything adjusted when you have splines. Hope that helps. All right, and we're wrapping it up. So why GG Surfit? I think it makes the creation of these very, very common figures super easy. The code is, uh, there's only a handful of functions you need to write uh, to remember, and you are ready to publish these. Uh, these figures. And I think the defaults have really been thought out quite well and they're very sensible. And we also do competing risks. So uh, if there are more questions, I'm happy to answer them now. All right. Well, I'm glad we got some answers uh, during along the way. And uh, please, uh, if you have questions, uh, go to Stack Overflow. There's a GG Surf Fit tag you can add to all of your Stack Overflow questions. Uh, I will be notified, uh, but there's also a chance that someone else will answer your question before I see it. And um, <clears throat> and that would be great. Uh, we have one more question. Can we get the slides so that we can use the codes and update as needed? Uh, yeah. Uh, can we put the slides into the slides URL into the chat? I don't have it with me at this very moment. And then we have another question, not a question, but can't thank you enough for the TT summary fact. Oh, oh thank you. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, thank you. All right, we'll leave it open until we get that. Uh, let me see if I can grab that. Copy. All right, I think I was able to pass, paste it in there. Um, so that's the link to the uh, webinars website, um, which has links to the slides, which will be updated with a link to the recording in the future. So I think that should have you covered. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming and sticking around for an hour about GG Surfit. Um, I hope that the package can help you create beautiful, figures, super reproducible, and super easy too. I like easy. Thank you, everyone.